Hey, again, I'm Keontae Davis and I'm with SAFI. Uh, Katrina and I today, um, you've heard um, throughout today about appropriate response and I know you guys are wondering now, how's it all working in South Carolina? Implementation um, of the appropriate response, uh, Family Strengthening and Voluntary Case Management Services uh, began in January of uh, 2012. Uh, SAFI was awarded, um, SAFI served as the master contractor for the services. Uh, again, we serve uh, 10 counties within the upstate. In the role of SAFI as the master contractor, really, we can't do it all, as you heard um, throughout the course of the day. Um, we, in turn, subcontract with several providers throughout the upstate. Our service, pro our service partners are Pickens Behavioral Health Services, and they service uh, Pickens County. Hope Center for Children, which is formerly the Ellen Hines Smith Girls Home, uh, Cherokee and Spartanburg Counties. New Foundation Home for Children, Anderson and Oconee Counties. SAFI provides services in Greenville County. And we have the Social Change Initiative, which provides services for Abbeville, Greenwood, Lawrence, and Newberry Counties. And I just want to recognize we do have uh, New Foundation's uh, program director here, and also SAFI, so if you guys can wave to the crowd. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and uh, again, my name is Katrina Morgan. I'm with Growing Home Southeast. Um, we, too, are the master contractors for regions two, three, four, and five for uh, the Department of Social Services. Um, in essence, that's 36 counties. The 36 remaining counties, we are the ones that are providing the AR services for them. The Coalition for Strengthening Families strives to eliminate or significantly reduce identified risk factors for child abuse and neglect. Our goal essentially is to eliminate or reduce that risk factor and also to enhance the protective capacities of the parents that we are serving. Um, our services are based on the belief that individuals, families, and communities are, um, have strengths and that families are the change agent, okay? Our um, partners, essentially, we had to do the same thing. We had to carve out some um, areas we had to carve out some partners in certain areas of the state to actually work and serve those areas. We have Billy Hardy, Home for Boys. Their, their service area is Chesterfield, Darlington, Dillon, Florence, and Marlboro. Carolina Youth Development, we have Berkeley and Charleston counties. Children's Place, who we have present in the room today, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, they are serving for us Aiken, Bamberg, Barnwell, Saluda, Edgefield, and McCormick counties. John K. Croswell is serving Clarendon, Lee, and Sumter counties. And Win Winwood Farm Home for Children, they are serving Charleston, Dorchester counties. Um, you should also know that we have two large uh, providers who are serving multiple counties and they have multiple offices in the state, one of which is South Carolina Mentor. They are serving Lexington, Union, Chester, Lancaster, York, Georgetown, Ori, Marion, and Williamsburg County. Growing Home Southeast, we are also, we subcontracted with ourselves. We are also <laughs> doing some of the work in the area, Fairfield, Kershaw, Richland, Chester, Lancaster, York, Allendale, Buford, Hampton, Jasper, Orangeburg, Calhoun, Collington. And we're doing VCM services only for Chesterfield, Darlington, Dillon, Florence, and Marlboro counties. Um, I, we do have another provider in the room with us today. I just want to make sure that any coalition member that's present in the room will be able to wave their hands and show who you are. Um, this is just a great opportunity for us to network, to get to know who some of the community providers are, um, so you can know who we are as well. We can exchange and exchange cards and numbers so that we can keep the uh, relationship going in the communities. Um, basically, um, serving as the master contractor, we are monitoring um, service delivery, uh, contract outcomes, you know, the fiscal responsibility we have as well. Um, we do provide training to our coalition partners and um, the quality assurance piece. So those are some of the things that we are responsible for um, as the master contractor. When we talk about the appropriate response, again, for South Carolina, the goal was to ensure consistency of the child welfare service um, in the state. 
So South Carolina DSS and both programs empowering families and South Carolina Coalition for Strengthening Families, there are several commonalities between the three of us. I'd like to talk to you just briefly about what some of those things are. The first thing that, um, that's very common in the programs that we're serving is that face-to-face -face contact. We all know that that is very important to ensuring the consistency, to ensuring the buy-in from families. For FSS, which is Family Strengthening Services, our contact is one time per month. For Voluntary Case Management, uh, our face-to-face -face contact is twice a month, and those contacts need to happen in the homes with the families we're engaged with. There is the safety and risk assessment that Jessica spoke to you briefly about, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. There's the comprehensive assessment that's done as well. There is the case plan, and there are certain points in time when a review is required for that. There's that all-time favorite documentation. Everybody in the room knows what that is. <laughs> it hasn't changed for us either. That is really important. That's something that we um, strive continually to, to meet the demands of the documentation. We're also linking, um, there's the linkage between um, to community services that are out in the field. And so we're doing that. There's the supervision. And I will tell you, in any program, supervision is probably one of the most important uh, pieces to the puzzle. Uh, and so we are really pleased to have um, excellent supervisors in our programs. They have a lot of responsibility. Um, I'm sure Keontae mm -hmm. will uh, you know, attest to that. Um, so we, we are very, um, pleased and satisfied with the level of supervision that we do have within the uh, AR. And then there's the case closure, okay? That is something that is very significant for the work that we do in terms of time frames, okay? Um, so talking again about the safety and risk assessment. Again, it's something that DSS does at the point of intake, and we do as providers um, after we make our initial safety and risk, I mean our initial visit with our families, we complete the safety and risk, and then at the point of closure or any time there's any sort of significant life change in the family situation. Um, we, I will say that the safety and risk is the primary uh, basis for our intervention. Okay, because on that safety and risk, we're going to be determining what the levels of risk are measured at. Uh, I believe that what South Carolina has done with the safety and risk has literally been to define safety for us as providers. So we don't have to guess. We take a look at the classification of safety. We take a look at that tab and we go through those 15 questions and it clearly identifies for us what areas of safety are. And again, as Jessica indicated, if we're working with the family, that safety is identified, we're going to shoot that case back to DSS for them to handle that issue for us. The second category is the risk assessment. Um, I will tell you the risk assessment is great. I mean, it's divided into four categories. We're talking about your baseline. We're talking about your child vulnerability. We're talking about your family. And then we're looking at the social and economic status of those families, OK? Um, and it's really um, some detailed information. It really causes us to really dive deep into what we're actually looking at, what we're encountering when we're working with our families. Um, so I will tell you that um, this safety and risk or this particular document in the program is probably one of the most important documents that we are each working with. And again, DSS is using this document at the point of intake, and then we're using this document again at the point of an actual face-to-face -face contact with our families. Comprehensive, another common document that we have uh, is the comprehensive family assessment. Again, who knows the family best other than the parent themselves? So again, we work with the families uh, to help them to identify the family's strength. We identify if there are any safety issues to determine what resources are needed in the family. So again, we, um, our case managers, again, we both have uh, family strengthening services workers and your VCM workers. Um, but again, we conduct those, uh, complete those comprehensive assessment to determine uh, what resources would be correct to use with those families. Again, um, working with those families, making sure that, um, again, understand that the, fam the program is a voluntary program. So again, once we have engaged the family, um, with us and, and engage them to accept the services again. Our next step then at that point would be to spend some time with the family to determine what their needs are. 
Once the needs um, have been determined, then our next step then would be to uh, help the family to create a case plan. We all need um, a uh, plan to, dis to take us to the end point. So again, we want to work with those families uh, to create a case plan. The case plan is created in conjunction with the family. Our workers don't uh, create the case plan and take it out and say, here, you sign this case plan. Again, we work together with those families to um, on those identified needs that the families feel that they need to work on. Again, some families may not, and if they can't, um, identify all of the, the issues or the problems that they need to work on, then our caseworkers help them to identify that. And again, that works uh, comes through with the family um, assessment. Also in working with those families, we also have um, on site or uh, with not on site with all of our, our programs, but we also have um, a voluntary case uh, liaison, liaison yeah. and what and we call those VCLs. And we that person one. is actually we have, one in the room. we have one in the room. Hi, Lori. VCL. <laughs> <laughs> uh, VCLs are uh, DSS employees. Um, who work with uh, each of the providers. Uh, we work with them closely. Um, they help us uh, once we get a referral in. They help us with any uh, additional. Back, additional information that's needed. If there's uh, some, if we're having difficulty locating the family, they are able to to utilize their resources through DSS to be able to help us with that. They help us with staffing of the uh, cases to kind of give us guidance with that. Uh, they also help us with sp special circumstances. So again, those, those VCLs are, are very important to our program. And it also shows the partnership with uh, the providers and DSS, us working closely uh, together. Uh, as far as the case plan, again with the case plan, the case plan is developed within the first 30 days of us working with the family, and then we uh, it's reevaluated every 90 days. However, if there are any changes within the families, then the case managers can actually um, update that case plan as needed. I know you heard a lot throughout the day um, about uh, protective factors. Again, how that ties in with us, we work with the families to help them increase their uh, protective capacities. Because again, that the goal of our program is to help those families and link them to community services. So when we're not involved with the family, if they ever need any assistance, they would know how to actually go out in the community and get the help themselves. So again, we have... Um, and we will go through each one of these uh, individually. But again, the, the important piece to know is as community partners, you play an important role in that in regards to us being able to link the families to services. Because I'm sure that you all have services that you can offer as well. The first one, parental uh, resilience. Again, it's just is how the uh, families are able to uh, bounce back. Families need skills and resources for coping with stress. You know, we all get stressed, and, and Alicia mentioned earlier, you know, we have people that we can call on. Again, being able to work with those families to uh, help them to, uh, to work with their stress. Uh, parents who are emotional resilient have a positive attitude. Uh, they are able to uh, solve their problems. Mm -hmm. They effectively address the challenges and then better able to deal with their children. Again, it's important, um, as we heard earlier today, um, it's important to help the parents understand uh, the developmental stages of their, their kids so that they can parent better. You know, again, Alicia gave the example this morning about uh, the kid having a temper tantrum in Walmart. Again, our case managers, that's our role. You know, we go out and we help the uh, families assist them in the area by connecting them with Maybe they need some parenting classes. We give them some parent education classes through the use of community partners. Uh, we actually help them uh, to identify family members and other people that can help them in their times of stress as well. Social connections. We, we all uh, have social connections. Again, our families do too. Some of them may not be as appropriate as we would like those connections to be, but we help those families to identify the, the positive uh, social connections within, the, within their social settings. So that can include family, friends, neighbors, you all, community members. Um, 
Again, providing your emotional support, helping the parents to solve problems, offer parenting advice, and give concrete assistance to the parents. That's what the social connections, that's what they do. FSS and VCM case managers help families to identify these connections. Again, sometimes when we go into the homes, you know, they may identify some connections and we're like, no, those connections are actually part of the problem. So again, <laughs> helping them to uh, find those positive uh, connections through trusted, caring uh, family and friends and community support partners. Okay, the um, Everlove Concrete Support. You know, when we think about, you know, we heard a lot today about um, the families that may be investigated and there's really not one thing that has happened that DSS should remain involved in, but there are those things, you know, there are certain things, elements that they could use some support in, they might need some help in certain areas. Um, we. When we think about concrete services, you know, we're thinking about those light bills and those water bills and those other kinds of um, community um, services out there. But, you know, support is, um, it's, a, it's vast. I mean, all families need support and it's different kinds of support. It's specific to whatever the family's need might be at any given point in time. And so though we want to be able to meet those very basic needs. We want their, the, you know, the children to have food. We want them to have that clothing. We think that shelter is very important. All of those things are true, but we also want to make sure that, that there's the social and the emotional sort of support that's there available for the family as well. Um, we want that support to be very practical. You know, we want it to be accessible. Um, and a part of the work that we do uh, in AR is that one, first we understand that there is a need. You know, we take a look mm -hmm. at ourselves and we see how we are being supported um, by family, by church members, by, you know, the coach who picks your kid up and, and has him there at the game when you can't be there. So we do see and understand and know that there's a need for support, but we wanna make sure that our families that we're serving understand that they have a right to uh, assess these services. They have a right to have support. You know, it's important to have that. It doesn't mean that you're not a good parent when you depend on somebody else to help you throughout any given day or any point in time in your life. So that's really, really critical for this. Um, we learn about, we help to teach them to learn about the available resources that are out here, which is why today is really important because the more we know about providers in our communities, the better we can help serve the families that we're working with. So we don't take today lightly at all. I mean, I'm passing out cards, I'm taking cards, and I'm connecting some of our providers with some of the community resources that are here in this room today because we know how important it is and we know that you have a service and our families have the need. And so we are taking the opportunity today to do that. Um, we wanna also make sure that our families not only know those services, but know how to navigate those services. They know what to do. They know how to get what they need. You know, sometimes we just assume that families understand. They know where to get the ABC voucher from. Well, they might, but that might be all that they know. So we take it a step further to help them to obtain an application. And if we have to go further, we take the step further to helping them to complete the application if that's necessary. And we're there to support them throughout the process of answering whatever questions might need to be answered, helping them to gather whatever piece of information they need in order to even qualify for a service that's out there for them. So this is really, you know, really critical work that we're doing when we just talk about concrete support. I wanna make sure we understand that it is a vast learning that's happening out there in the field with the families we're serving. Okay, the social and emotional competence of children. The point about communication, I gotta tell you, you know, cause in the families that we're serving, we're serving, you know, our kids are anywhere from zero to 18. Um, and you do communicate with a three-year-old differently than you do with a 13-year-old. We all, you know, know that. I mean, I'm learning that. I have some kids on the, that are getting ready to be teenagers, and so I have to adjust 
as a parent, how I'm dealing with them, how I'm communicating with them. Um, I have to help them understand how they need to communicate with me now that they're 13 and no longer three. So there's a lot of, you know, true negotiation that's happening and our staff are equipped to understand that and know what that is and know what that means and how that should be played out in each individual family that we're actually serving. Um, because I'll tell you that this is not, you know, a natural evolution. It really is a learned process. And so that's what we want to make sure that our families and our parents understand. Um, and so what we want our parents to do is to always be creating opportunities for their kids to, one, you know, learn to better communicate, you know, learn to use your words, not in the Walmart screaming and yelling or simply just pointing for what you want, but using your words to ask for what it is that you are wanting or desiring at a point in time. And then figuring out how to transition that from age to age for each child that you're doing so that there's always this consistent, constant learning that's taking place in the um, families that we're serving. Um, we believe that children um, learning to uh, effectively communicate feelings in a positive manner really reinforces, you know, that self-esteem, that self-efficacy, um, all the things that help us to be better individuals in the community. So that's very important for us. And these things also build and foster good relationships. And that's going to be a good relationship in the daycare, that you're not biting the next kid or you're not pinching or doing those things that might get you removed from the daycare. Um, it's good in school that you're understanding, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer relationship and what the differences are between um, being in kindergarten where you had a nap, now being in first grade where you don't get the nap anymore, you know, just understanding those kinds of things and navigating through those kinds of things until you're in college, you know. Um, knowing that that's a huge difference, you know, in your educational learnings. And so, you know, we believe that, you know, from home to school to the community at large, and when they're, you know, dealing with you as a community provider, whether it be um, early Head Start or whatever the program is, that they understand that communication is uh, key. It's key. Okay, nurturing and attachment. Clearly, uh, relationships matter. You know, I, I want to just say that and walk away because that's, that defines it. You know, it's so important for us to be able to relate to other people. Um, it's so important for us to um, understand that it's not um, just for individuals and individual families, but it's for individual families within communities as well, that relationships really do matter. And there's this growing body of work out there that supports all of these protective factors that we've talked about and how that impacts the child welfare system as a whole, our communities as a whole. And so it's just important for us to um, understand the nurturing and the attachment, understand those small the, the small years and growing up into the adult years, how very important and how critical they are for us, um, for our kids to experience um, that understanding and that attachment. Okay? Okay, so we're rolling right along. And one thing that we <laughs> wanted to make sure that you guys understood was that it's, we're not just doing AR just because, but we want you to know that there are true benefits to this work that's happening in South Carolina. Um, and a part of that is that your kids are in the home. You know, um, you would not believe the fear that our families have when we approach them. But once we explain to them that we're, we're not here to remove your kids, in fact, we don't have the authority to do that, our goal is really to increase your ability to keep them here in the home. It's a, so, it's a totally different atmosphere that's encountered at that point in time. And so one of the benefits is that your kids stay here. You know, and we have to say that sometimes right out, right front, immediately, so that we can get the buy-in uh, for them to participate in this volunteer program. Um, the development of the individualized case plan. Um, you know, we're working with multiple families with multiple issues, and it's important for us to get it right because these services are short-term services. We don't maintain our cases open for long lengths of time. For FSS, it's three to six months. 
For VCM, it's six to 12 months. So we have a very short window of time that we have to work with our families. And so it's important for us to get that assessment done right, get that case plan written in a way that the families can see progress and we can see the risk levels either being reduced or eliminated in the families that we're working with. Assistance with concrete services. You know, we talked about those concrete services. It's, you know, that's a great need out in the community. And so a part of what we have had to do as providers is, you know, either buy for grants, you know, for Growing Home Southeast, we got a couple of grants from, from uh, one from United Way of the Midlands that serves just a few counties that we have in the Midlands area. We've had to acquire a grant from Starbucks, which was great. It was a plus. Um, that money comes in handy because, again, we're serving 36 counties, so there's lots of need that is out there. We've had to acquire other grants, and, and some of them are in small amounts, and some of them are in much larger amounts. Some of them are specific for clothing, and some of them are specific for school needs or school supplies. But we've had to go out into the community and we've had to talk about the needs that our families have and we had to get buy-in from some, from some folk that were willing to say, we're here and we can assist you. And so we hope that that's the same kind of outcome we get from the group today, that you, if you've got funding that's available, please come see me, no offense. <laughs> But come see me because I can put your funds to great, great use because there is truly a need out there for our families. Um, the parent and education and training. I will tell you that as a part of our work as a master contractor, we are training our staff. We are currently working off of the family strengthening curriculum that we do in sessions within our home settings. It's actually marvelous because it gives our staff direction and it leads us to an outcome that's achievable for our families. And so that work is happening. We have also partnered with some other providers in the community where we don't have a specific partner located, but we're working in a cluster of counties. We've actually partnered with some of those providers in the area to provide that, that sort of um, parenting education that our families actually need. We do understand, and I hope that after today, we, we would have said it so much that you understand that we can't do this work alone and so the expectation is that you will you know chime in and join in and help us to to do this work but um, that's a very key to us having successful outcomes in this program is that we we have some guided work there and that's what that does for us assistance with identifying and building a support system Essentially, that's what we're doing because, you know, sometimes our families don't even know that they've got a support. All they know is that their neighbor sometimes brings them milk. They don't necessarily see the neighbor as a support, but clearly here's a support that they may not have tapped into completely. They don't know that the church is there and available. You know, I don't go, I don't go to church. They won't help me. But they don't understand that the churches are there to assist them whether they commit to being a member or not, you know, so helping them to understand that there are some services out there that would be beneficial for you and your family is a big part of what uh, we are doing um, here uh, in this work. Uh, we also use um, family group conferencing. So we're using some of the supports that DSS actually offers. We have the ability to benefit, our families are benefiting from some of those things, and one of those being family group conferencing. And I think there's, there's some other services that DSS offers that we are able to uh, take advantage of as well, and we certainly do love to do that. Um, I'll tell you that for our staff and the degree levels that they have, these families also have access to a professional sort of consultant, a professional sort of advocate who's teaching and training them how to move forward alone without us, because again, this work is short term. I think, Katrina, also to add along with some of the benefits, not only to the parents, but some of the benefits for the community in the state. Again, like I said, it started in uh, January of last year in the upstate, and of course now um, in May of last year throughout the entire state. And one of the things that we have recognized as, as partners, Katrina and I, we, we speak often, again, so that we can actually uh, make sure that the, the services that we are providing is consistent throughout the state. Um, also, we know when working with families, um, our families move a lot. 
So one of the benefits of this program is, you know, now that it's statewide, they can move from Greenville to Charleston. And what we do, because we work together, we have the ability to actually transfer that case down to uh, one of the service partners provided by uh, Growing Homes. So again, being able to still follow that family, because again, it could be a scary thing for some of those families when they have to move and then go to a new place and, and don't know how to ask for help, again, mm -hmm. we can connect them with one of our uh, partners as well. Um, again, definitely with the concrete services, uh, Again, working closely with the community. Um, now that you guys are here today, knowing uh, which area you fall in with regards to growing homes or SAFI, and if you have uh, services at your at your agency, whether it's parenting programs, uh, whether it's uh, education, whatever it is, you know, again, please identify yourself to us today so that we can link our families up with um, with your agency. Um, again, funding is very, you know, funding is limited. Um, through SAFI, we offer uh, family assistance with some of our families to kind of meet some of those concrete uh, services need, but, you know, it's, it's not enough, you know, mm -hmm. and again, it's also trying to educate our parents. Uh, Katrina talked a lot about uh, the quality of professional uh, staff that we, we have. Again, we also, you know, make sure that our staff um, that's throughout uh, the state that we're trained um, to be able to meet the needs of these families as well too. So again, I just wanted to point out again how closely uh, Growing Homes and SAFI, how we work closely together to be able to provide consistency throughout the state when working with these families. Okay, now what, how can you help? Um, some of the things that we have identified um, in both programs throughout the state that um, transportation, you know, transportation is, is a problem throughout the state. Again, many, we're serving uh, 46 counties here in, uh, throughout South Carolina. You know, some of the families live in areas where there's uh, public transportation. They can, they live on the bus line and they can catch the bus. You know, we have some families that um, live out in the rural areas and they, they don't have um, access to uh, transportation. We talked earlier a lot about the social connections. Again, they don't um, have anyone that they can call on to ask to take them to their appointments. Uh, so again, we have, recognize that transportation is a problem. Again, working with families with special special needs, uh, disabilities, our Spanish-speaking population, again, um, being able to have services uh, for them as well, we recognize that we need um, additional services for those families as well. Sorry. Um, got a little happy there. Uh, <laughs> uh, mental health providers. One of the things that uh, Katrina and I, we, we talked about and it's recognized throughout the state, a lot of our families um, are able to get mental health services to the, to the state, mental health. However, what we've recognized is that um, sometimes there's a wait list. Um, it's, it, it takes a long time um, for our families to actually get an appointment or to get those services. Um, the appointment, and by the time they get the appointment, you know, some of our families like, ah, oh, forget it. So again, um, being able to identify other providers um, throughout the state that's able to uh, provide those mental health services for those families uh, with Medicaid and without, even if some of our families that uh, don't have Medicaid services may cannot afford to pay the copay or whatever it is to, to get those services. Victim assistance services, you know, unfortunately there's not enough uh, services out there to aid with our victim assistance. Again, we, we definitely, when you think about domestic violence, there's services out there. However, throughout the state, there are some counties that may receive more services than others or have access to those services. So again, that's also one that uh, we have identified as uh, some limitations there. Child care services, many of our families are, when they're trying to uh, gain employment, um, they may not qualify for ABC vouchers. And again, talking about those social connections, they may not have uh, identified anyone that can help them with child care. On the other note of that, you have the uh, older children, age 12 and above, who may not necessarily, if 
daycare, I believe, stops at 12. Mm -hmm. So again, those families uh, are placed with a difficult situation on trying to find child care and or after school care for, uh, for their children. Lack of space in local shelters. Sometimes, you know, our families go through, through difficulties. You know, rather it's uh, a temporary housing situation where they have to maybe downsize because of uh, financial reasons. Maybe someone lost their job and they're having to downsize. And in between, they may uh, be without a home for, you know, maybe a day or two or something. But being able to find and identify those local shelters that will be able to, to uh, keep those families uh, together. And again, we also talk about with our uh, families in uh, crisis. Here we go. We're talking again about the funding. You know, those who may have called your caseworker up at the last hour and say, hey, my rent is due tomorrow mm -hmm. or my light is about to get cut off or, you know, something like that. And again, with us not being able to have those uh, services readily available or the funding readily available, um, it, is, it is difficult. Um, and both Katrina and I spoke earlier about what we have at our agency. Katrina identified a couple of resources through United Way and some other programs that they have. And of course, we have our family assistance, but again, very yeah. small. Yeah. Minute. Uh, and uh, again, when we, when particularly we're working with uh, older teens, being able to uh, identify the behavior versus neglect issues, again, the families may be trying their best to deal with those families, with the kid that's acting out, but it may come across as the parent being neglectful. However, the child having some behavior issues, so we have identified that there's a need for uh, services to deal with older teens. I know through SAFI we uh, offer uh, parenting with love and limits with uh, being able to work with our older teens, but again, that is still a, a small population and definitely trying to have services that will help with uh, services for the older teens and be able to uh, identify um, behavior interventions to work with the teenagers. Anything you want to add? Nope. Your turn. Is that a DSS question? <laughs> can, can we get you to repeat the question? Where was it? I was just asked the question, how, would, how was it determined which of the two contract holders would service which of the 46 counties? I can answer that. Um, we, we did some data analysis to determine what populations were in what parts of the state, and then we did a competitive bid process in three areas of the state, so the upstate with the 10 counties that SAFI has, and then we combined region three and four in, the, in one solicitation, and then um, what we call our area two and part of five. So it was, it was a competitive bid process, but it was based on data how we split up the uh, how we split up the state. Is either one of the agencies working with the homeless children, um, zero to five, that are in their, their local areas? Working, if we... Like, was that one of the risk factors, or um, do homeless children qualify for... So let me tell you a little bit about the process and how actually AR, um, how our families become involved. Essentially, there has been a report made to DSS of abuse and neglect. DSS makes a determination about the way they want to respond to the report that has been made. And there are four ways, I think, that she, um, they were indicated today. It's either that DSS will have no action if it doesn't meet their standard criteria. Then it was FSS, which is your low risk, families that you're serving, then it's VCM, which is your moderate level of risk, and then it's your high and your safety, which are cases that DSS maintains to do a uh, thorough investigation, investigation on those cases. 
Um, and so all of the families that we work with, as a res they come from DSS to us. And so we do have populations of homeless families where I'm certain that there are kids of that age range that are a part of those homeless uh, families that we're serving. Um, so yes, do you have a service that you specialize in for homeless children that you'd like for us to know about? Yes, we do, and uh, what we'd like to do basically is get your card so that you know we can connect families with you. If you've got a service for that that family type, we certainly have that family type in our in in our. Um, What's your county? So. Ori. Ori County. Okay. Yes, you can give me. I have a question. How are you um, sharing or implementing this new strategy or approach with local school districts? as well as local law enforcement agents who are the first responders? What we have been doing, um, what Growing Home Southeast has been doing is partnering with the county offices. They have been holding, several of them have been holding community meetings that have involved much of the professional uh, providers in their area. Um, and we've been talking about this new uh, approach, this new way to uh, that DSS is doing business. So we've been a part of that and, and sharing of this work, this AR work. And so have SAFI as well too, um, as far as partnering with uh, DSS, because again, it was, um, it is a partnership. And as DSS went out to speak with the judges, uh, police officers, school district, things like that, I've participated in the roll calls at all different <laughs> hours. So again, we, we did uh, try to do a strong push to let the uh, community know um, who we are, what we're doing. And again, and it takes, once we have informed the community, then at that point we ask that each person then tell someone else about what we're doing. So we, we too also went out and did a good push for uh, the community awareness. Do you have um, a formal way of, of having MOAs with agencies that are going to provide services for you? And what kind of information could a community um, partner expect to receive from one of your agencies prior to your client showing up at our door? Good two-part question. Right. I think I might right. have lost some of the question. But um, to answer your question about the MOAs and mm -hmm. establishing the coalitions, um, those things have, they, they have happened, um, and, um, but again, we're always looking and expanding in that work for, for the coalition, um, and I would probably not be the right person for Growing Home Southeast to answer that question, but there is a formal process um, mm -hmm. that we go through in order to bring a partner on board. I, I, I'm not talking about one of these people that you had on the board. Oh, okay. I'm, talking about, I'm talking about a provider of services to your clients that are community-based. And my question is, um, how much of a relationship are your providers able to have with your caseworkers to make sure that the services we're providing are indeed yes. what your clients need? Okay. What I, we have um, Peggy from Children's Place in the back who's willing to answer. She's a provider for the And then also before coalition. Peggy comes on board, I think as far as, uh, yes, at SAFI we do have the opportunity to enter into agreements with, uh, with our partners. Um, and, it's, and that's encouraged in regards to the communication with the... Uh, with uh, new agencies that come on board and even we're making referrals to. So again, what we do, if we have identified that we want to make a referral to your agency, then the caseworker will then be encouraged to make that contact with you. And then also we, we have, um, what do you call it? Consent, yeah, release, yeah. <laughs> so, that, uh, so that we can remain in contact with you to, to be part of that support. Because again, if we're making a referral to you, we want to also make sure that um, uh, 
our families are following through with that, being able to support that family, but then also have that connection with you as well to say, hey, well, how's it going to make sure that, you know, um, the services are being rendered. Well, which county are you with? Beaufort County. Oh. So, um, and in the PD area. Um, we can talk later to talk about that because it just depends upon your services and the needs of our families. Again, you know, our services that are being rendered are very specific to the family's needs. So. Oh, okay. okay. Well, we can talk oh, about yeah. that. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly, we'll have a conversation with you about that. I'm sure you can get him some referrals. <laughs> well, generally, do, would you like to speak as a provider what your, um, what your staff do to uh, make well, referrals as, and link families? As a provider, I mean, we've been doing this business for a long time, so we already have some MOAs in place with local providers. Uh, we know how they want their referrals to be made. We are doing that now with AR services, and we've also entered into one or two other memorandums of agreement with other providers to include then our family. So for instance, concrete needs. In our area, we have a provider who we agreed not to go out and ask for money for that, and they would cover those for our families. So trying to make sure that when you're doing those services, you are mindful of who your partners are within your community. Because mm -hmm. I think that that's real important, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we don't overlook who the existing players mm -hmm. are um, with these families. And how do we continue those relationships and enhance them and grow them in a way that's going to cover these families as well? So that's what we've done. Any other questions? Oh. Um, I was looking at your list of collaborative, uh, collaborating pa partners, and I saw a couple of either residential or group homes on those lists. So I just wondered how you work along with them in what capacity? With, and she's an upstate. Uh, uh, with our, yes, and we actually have uh, New Foundations and uh, Ellen Hines Smith. And, and, I get, and that is a good question because I don't want people to get confused that because they're group, residential uh, homes that we work with them to refer our children to, uh, to those residential for placement. We don't. Um, again, um, although those agencies' primary uh, form of business is a residential facility, uh, when this came on board because of their experience in uh, working with children with the at-risk population. We partner with them, but it's like a division mm -hmm. of, that, um, of, of that agency. So again, it's a separate entity. So again, working with those people with, the with new foundations and the Hope Center. The, the name just changed, so I'm trying to remember it. But <laughs> with um, the, the Hope Center, uh, formerly Ellen Hines Smith. Again, it is a separate division. So again, we work with them um, just like our other subcontractors. We had to train all of those, uh, all of our staff. But again, they get the same training that we do and they follow under the umbrella of SAFI in the Power and Families program. Although they are employed um, by the group home, they follow our guidelines. Is that what you were? Uh, so just to make sure I understand. Uh -huh. so I'm sorry. <laughs> so then some of the staff there would render some services to the families, or is there respite available? Cause no, no, part of our no, not through with the residential with the residential program. The staff uh, for uh, the residential new foundations, um, they're employed to do this program only. Um, and the services that now, and I know with some of the programs, we may make referrals to their parenting program, because I know New Foundations have a parenting program. We may make referrals there, but we don't utilize the residential facility at all. We don't use it for respite. We don't make recommendations to, for the kid to be placed at the residential. Because again, if we feel like the kid needs to be removed from the home, then that's a safety issue, and we send it back to DSS, and DSS makes that determination. Again, so, but it is a separate program. Mm -hmm. That light is killing me. So 
so where is your substance abuse in all of this? Um, I know that you said you contracted with um, different entities across the state, but where is substance abuse? You mentioned mental health, but I didn't hear anything about substance abuse except for Pickens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, uh, we utilize the community partners. Um, again, yes, Pickens Behavioral Health. We utilize uh, the Phoenix Center in the upstate as well, too. So again, um, substance abuse is a huge part of our program because many of our families um, have some uh, issues with substance abuse. So again, we do uh, utilize our community partners with that as well. There's one in the back, way in the back, way in the back. <laughs> Look, but I write it down. Okay. Um, as a school social worker, um, before this new system was developed, I was able to communicate with the DSS caseworker regarding, say, an open case. And now what I'm finding is that if a family is getting services through the community partners, I don't have any relationship with that person. Say, if I need to provide follow-up concerns, so how can we continue to have the kind of relationship that you know I found that I used to have with, say, a DSS yeah, case yeah. manager with, well, say, with <laughs> Safi or <clears throat> Growing Homes? A big part of the work that we do is um, getting having our families our families are going to maintain control of the work that we do with them. And in essence, we have to get them to sign a consent, sign a release for us to communicate with anybody that they have worked with in the past or anybody that they're going to be working with as a result of us being involved with them. Um, so if we, if we know that you have been working with the family um, by way of communicating it with your state DSS, whichever county that you're working with, again, we do have the VCL on site. The DSS office can communicate that with the VCL that's on site and in our offices and let us know that you were a part of um, work that was going on with the family. We can then communicate with the families about continuing services with you, um, communicating with you, but they have to give us consent to do that um, in, in working with you. So that is the difference between you know, working with DSS and now having the community partners uh, a part of it. But you know, we are all the time trying to know what services were actually in place or what services families were actually um, receiving so that we can continue to communicate with them and continue to serve the families together. We certainly do want to be able to communicate with you, but we can't do it unless the families agree. Were you also asking, were you saying that you may have made the referral and you wanted you made the referral to DSS and you wanted to either follow up and or offer additional information? Um, yes, say for example, a report was made to DSS and that family said, well, we don't have any information about the family that they were working with. Um, yes, Yeah, and I, and I follow what you're saying, and I don't think that you don't necessarily may have some follow-up with that, because typically what happens, too, if we already have a case and we're involved in a case and someone calls to offer additional information, DSS may not necessarily take another case because we already have it, but what they would do is communicate with us and mm -hmm. through the VCL to say, hey, we just got another call, this is some more information that was shared. So again, although 
It may not have been communicated to you that the information was shared, but typically that's what happens when we're working with a case and additional information comes through that uh, DSS intake would then share it with the uh, VCL who in turn shares it with us so we'll know the additional information.